Our next speaker is going to be uh, Trent uh, Robinates, uh, who's going to be talking to us about diversifying stomatal parameters in catchment CN45. So yeah, please take it away, Trent. Awesome, thank you. Um, I just want to start this talk by kind of saying that in all the parameter optimization chats we've been having so far, when we talk about vegetation parameters, kind of these predictions are largely underlined by the fact that we use the plant functional type parameter to represent vegetation diversity, where kind of, as many of us know, kind of you take the whole globe and you divide it up into about categories. And then we assume that everywhere with the same plant functional type has the same plant traits. But I think this is a, a known to be a pretty big issue in kind of our current state of land models, where kind of many studies have consistently shown that plant functional types really fail to accurately capture vegetation diversity. And often studies find that there's as much variability in many of these important plant traits uh, within a single PFT as there are across all the plant functional types. And so today I just wanna, uh, in my presentation, pick a fight with plant functional types and hopefully do that by showing you how I've implemented a new method to move beyond PFTs for vegetation parameterization. And then hopefully by the end, I'll have showed you that this new method improves land surface model predictions of stream flow. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be talking a lot about G1, which is um, should be known to kind of most people as the slope of the Medlin's to model conductance equation. And so what this plant trait really does is dictate how much water is lost through stomata for each unit of carbon gained for a plant in a given location. And in this presentation, I'll be uh, kind of using the land surface model catchment CN 4.5, um, which is developed by the folks at, at NASA Goddard and has kind of the Medlin representation of stomatal conductance and G1 plays an important role in this land surface model. And so I think the first thing that's important to acknowledge is that we have global estimates of G1. So if we wanna move beyond plant functional types, why don't we just take them and implement those directly into catchment CN 4.5? Um, but something kind of that many of you might be familiar with called compensating errors is gonna prevent us from doing that. But just to kind of quickly illustrate what I mean by this, I wanna take this uh, in this example, this tree in reality on the left and this kind of modeled version of this tree on the right. And kind of from the outset, what is very common in models and happens all the time is that kind of the amount of soil moisture, for example, available to this tree uh, has an error in it. It doesn't match reality. But in order to get kind of uh, predicted ET to match observed ET, the parameters in our model here, G1, have been tuned such that uh, they don't match reality, but we get good predictions of ET. And so if we were to take our G1 value from reality, and directly put it into the model, we'd actually end up hurting our model predictions of the flux that we care about. And so if we wanna kind of achieve this goal of moving beyond plant functional types and better representing vegetation spatial diversity, uh, we really have two things we need to be able to do with our new parameterization scheme. Kind of the outset goal of increasing spatial variability, but then we also want to be able to account for these compensating errors that we know exist in our model. And so today I'll be asking, could we achieve both of these needs by predicting our plant traits in any location as a function of their local environment? And we think that we can do this because we expect that plant traits have evolved because of the local environment in which they sit. And there have been some previous studies here in a, kind of a intermediate complexity terrestrial biosphere model where they showed that using this parameter environment relationship prediction strategy, um, actually does just as well as plant functional types. And so we wanted to ask, can a strategy such as this be implemented in a fully operational land surface model, like the types of models we've been talking a ton about in this workshop, um, such as for my case, catchment CN 4.5. And so to actually implement this strategy, what we did is we took kind of some sample environmental factors, such as mean annual precipitation, et cetera, and we simply fit a linear equation to predict our parameter of interest here, the parameter G1, as a function of these sample environmental predictors, kind of these X of S values in our linear equation. And then we can fit these B coefficients and this AI overall scaling factor that'll be PFT specific to try to predict G1. And if we remember back to kind of 
the two goals that we said this parameterization scheme needed, that is increasing spatial variability and accounting for compensating errors, this method kind of can achieve both. Because this X of S, these environmental predictors, will hold the spatial variability that we are looking for in our new parameterization scheme. And then we can tune our coefficients online in the model itself to be able to account for these compensating errors. And so to actually kind of take this equation and put it in the land surface model of interest, we had two steps that we performed. Or in step one, we actually had to choose which environmental predictors do we want to use in this equation. And then in step two, we had to go about optimizing these A and B coefficients to be the best version they could. And we did that by minimizing error in the model predicted of apotranspiration and stream flow. And so just to quickly walk through how we actually did this step one, we took kind of a bunch of sample environmental predictors like ones that I'm showing here. And we used that kind of global estimate of G1 map that I showed earlier to fit a bunch of possible combinations of the linear equation and then used AIC to select the best form of this linear equation. And what we ended up using was predicting G1 simply as a function of mean annual precipitation at a location and canopy height at a location. And now that we've selected this final form of linear equation, we proceeded by taking it and replacing the PFT-based G1 encashment CN 4.5 with this uh, linear equation to predict G1 encashment CN 4.5. And then we optimized and found kind of the final values of these A and B coefficients by optimizing our, uh, them against uh, catchment CN 4.5 ET from Gleam, or compared to Gleam, and then trying to minimize stream flow error in catchment CN 4.5 compared to camels. Uh, and we kind of ultimately used the particle swarm optimization algorithm to iteratively update these coefficients and converge on the best uh, predictive equation for G1. And I just wanted to note that uh, we performed this optimization at unregulated basins larger than 1,000 square kilometers across the continental US. And this 1,000 square kilometers number came from the fact that we want to ensure that each basin is greater than or equal to one catchment CN 4.5 pixel to ensure we're representing that basin with our land surface model. And when we kind of apply these criteria, we are left with the following basins I'm showing here. I just want to note that we have a pretty good representation of kind of the entire continental US with these basins. And finally, I just wanted to find how I'm going to evaluate our model improvement or degradation compared to PFTs with this new parameter prediction method. And this kind of objective function looks scary, but basically to look at how uh, our stream flow was improving, we're just taking the mean absolute error at each basin over all time points and normalizing it by the average stream flow at that basin. And then we use the exact same objective function for our ET predictions, where again, we take our mean absolute error for ET at each time point, and then just normalize that by the ET at that model pixel, because we're comparing across a lot of different uh, basins and pixels. And so finally, to get to the good stuff, uh, kind of this equation here on the right is going to be the metric I'm using to evaluate performance, where I'm using that objective function as found by our PFT-based model, minus the objective function as found by our new optimization method. And when we compare the two methods, we get this map where everywhere in green is where our new method that I've presented here is doing better. Everywhere in pink is where the, the plant functional site method is doing better. And what kind of really two stands out to me- trend. Thank you. Two minutes. What really, what really stands out to me about this method um, is that kind of there's really, a couple basins where we have really dark green. Notably, there's kind of uh, a cluster of five basins that I've circled down here in the bottom right-hand corner, kind of the southeastern US, and then another one in Texas. Um, and what we find is these basins where there is a large difference in between our methods come from a, a combination of the fact that there's just a large G1 difference between our two, between my new method and the PFT-based method in these basins. But also these are places where PFTs were doing really poorly uh, in kind of uh, the default based model. And when we look across the whole continental US, we see that this new method improves upon plant functional types by about 6%. Um, and when can we look closer, we end up seeing that nearly this entire 6% improvement is due to the, to the improvement found in these six basins I've circled here. 
So the takeaway here, I would say, is that this new method, this predicting traits from the environment I've presented here, really improves upon places where PFTs struggle to get accurate stream flow. And it does that without necessarily sacrificing performance in other basins where plant functional types were already doing all right. So I then just wanted to round out the story by going ahead and showing kind of the, uh, the similar map, but for our VEPO transpiration predictions, since that was our other constraint. And again, showing kind of this map where everywhere in green is where our, our new method does better. Everywhere in pink is where the plant functional type based method does better. And really the takeaway here is that across the board, these colors are super faded. There's nowhere where we see huge differences between the two methods. And kind of our overall change confirms that where our new method is worse by about 1%. And so the takeaway here uh, that I show kind of in subsequent analyses I don't have time to get into here is really that G1 just has a much smaller effect on normalized ET than it does on normalized stream flow. And so with the current setup uh, of kind of how I've been optimizing our new methods and comparing PFTs and my new method, there's G1 is just much more impactful on stream flow. And we're seeing the majority of the impact uh, on stream flow as opposed to ET. And so with that, I'd really like to thank my lovely collaborators who helped me on this project and thank you all for uh, your attention.